Good afternoon, everyone, um, and welcome to New Faces in the Briefing Room, the second panel of today's symposium on the press, the presidency, and trust, sponsored by the Institute of Politics and Public Service, aka GU Politics, and the White House Correspondents Association. A special welcome to the recently announced 2021 WHCA scholarship winners for joining us virtually from across the country today. Uh, my name is Darcy Palder, and I'm a senior in the college studying government with only minor <laughs> in journalism. Um, geopolitics was actually my first home on the hilltop because before I even started classes, um, I took part in the Institute's week-long political boot camp. Uh, ever since then, I have been grateful for the community, mentors, and friends I've met through geopolitics who have held my hand through elections, challenged me to rethink my own political views, and guided me through landing internships and most recently a job. Uh, I am so glad that events like this bring even more people into the geopolitics community, and I really encourage everyone to stop by the Baker Living Room because you really never know what conversations you'll have or who you ha might have them with and where those conversations will take you. So today, it is my honor to in introduce a super cool panel for all of us. Um, since 2016, Jeanette Rodriguez has been a White House correspondent for Univision, the largest provider of Spanish language content in the United States. Chris Johnson is the chief political and White House reporter for the Washington Blade, the oldest LGBT newspaper in the country. And Sunmin Kim is a White House correspondent for the Washington Post, as well as a CNN political analyst. The panel will be moderated by Karen Travers, an ABC News White House correspondent, member of the WHCA board, an undergraduate and graduate school alumnus of Georgetown, and a fall 2019 geopolitics fellow. So we have a really great lineup for all of us. Um, stay engaged with the discussion on social media by tagging geopolitics and hashtag geopolitics forum. For those in the Zoom room, you, you can submit questions using the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Um, please make sure to include your name and affiliation. And now, Karen, over to you. Thank you, Darcy. That was a great introduction. And congratulations on a job. That's great. <laughs> I was glad to hear that geopolitics had such, such an impact on your time at Georgetown. That's fantastic. It's a wonderful program. So if you're listening, watching, and haven't jumped in on the events and activities, please do that very soon. Uh, Thank you guys to my colleagues in the White House Press Corps for joining me on this panel. I'm really excited and we've got a lot to get to. We're gonna have student questions, but first we're gonna have a little conversation uh, with just the four of us. And I should note, it would have been five of us, our colleague, Michelle Cinder, the newly named anchor host of Washington Week is out on assignment and she unfortunately will not be able to make it today because work calls. <laughs> it's always a busy time, so we will miss her, but uh, we're excited to get into this. So I think we're just gonna start off uh, with the easy one. So we got your bios there, but tell us, uh, go through each one of you, whoever wants to jump in first, how long you've been covering the White House and what's the biggest difference that you've noticed in the briefing room, the people that are there asking the questions every day from your first day there to where we are now on May 5th, 2021. Sure, I'll go first if that's okay. So I joined uh, Univision actually, uh, back on April 4th of uh, 2016. So it's been five years, a little over five years. And my very first day at the White House, President Obama came out to the briefing room to give a press conference. And I had to go on a ladder to be able to get a peek of the president. I didn't have a seat in the briefing room at that time. And when you talk about what has changed the crowd, I mean, Obviously, the pandemic has played a big role as to the amount of people that we can have in the briefing room to keep ourselves safe. But I remember that day, oh my, that was a crowd in that briefing room to see President Obama and to be able to ask him questions. I was able to get a question also, the very last press conference that President Obama held. And that time too, there were, I don't know what the limit in that briefing room is, but it was at capacity. And ever since I have seen those crowds dwindled, although with the Trump administration in the, those very first days, it was very crowded as well. But, um, but we'll see once the pandemic passes, how we can go back, if we go back to those crowds. But that's my first impression of that briefing room, just like shoulder to shoulder, very tight, trying to get a question of President Obama at the time. Yeah, it's much smaller on TV or when you're really in there that I think how it looks on West Wing and all the TV shows. Uh, Chris, you want to go next? Sure thing. Um, I um, likewise have been a White House reporter uh, since the Obama administration. I started in, in 2009. So I've been uh, working for the Washington Blade uh, uh, as the White House reporter for um, you know uh, more than a decade now. 
uh, through the Obama administration, Trump administration, now the Biden, uh, now the Biden administration. And uh, I know Robert Gibbs is on the uh, panel, the previous one. He was the press secretary when I first started. Um, and I, I know that uh, this is a panel on diversity. And in case there's any questions about why this white guy is on a panel on diversity, it is because <laughs> I'm gay and I, I, I'm a reporter for the Washington Blade, which is the nation's oldest LGBTQ newspaper. And uh, we are the only LGBTQ newspaper in the White House pre and the press corps uh, there every day holding our, na our nation's leader accountable on issues that are important to the LGBT community and making contributions on uh, LGBT related news developments for the uh, for the uh, White House press corps at large at the same time. So um, it's kind of, uh, I don't know how a misnomer, however, that I'm a new face. I mean, I, I'm, I've been in the uh, briefing now for more than a decade, but otherwise I understand the gist of the, uh, the panel's direction. I would say over this time, the changes that I have noticed, um, in addition to a you know growing diversity that we've seen in the White House press corps uh, in terms of ethnicity, I would also think that there's a lot of greater diversity in terms of the type of media outlet that's in the White House press corps. Uh, you know, a lot, lot more. Um, uh, uh, I would say uh, non-mainstream media publications, uh, publications that are specific audiences for smaller audiences, and then. Uh, at the same time, uh, I also see maybe as a result of that, kind of the nature of the questions that are being asked in the White House briefings, uh, they seem to be a little more, people seem to be more willing to take, uh, uh, you know, uh, be, be riskier in their questions. And I think this is a good thing. I think they're talking about subjects that might be uh, previously might have thought about, ta uh, you know, have been taboo. Um, but now I just, that people are willing to uh, take a second look at and, and get out into the open. So. Uh, big changes in the, in the, in the press corps not, and, and diversity and, and many levels. Take it away, Sungman. Hi, so I had actually started covering the White House under the Trump administration. So my, uh, my first and my main love is Congress. Uh, sorry to the White House reporter diehards on here. Uh, but uh, at, the, at the Washington Post, I've been focusing primarily on, you know, first the Trump administration and now the Biden administration's relationship with Capitol Hill. So I don't have a huge long, um, a hugely long kind of a time frame to pull from, but just between uh, February of 2018, which is when I started at the Post and in the Speed, and now um, what some of the observations I can share is just obviously the frequency and the regularity of the briefing room actually being used under the Biden administration. It's very, it's daily unless the president is traveling, um, usually even around the same time, you know, Jen Psaki, the press secretary goes through the full complement of reporters in the briefing room. Whereas obviously under Trump, through the success of press secretaries, it was a lot more irregular. I, I started um, under uh, Sarah Sanders and she would hold them on occasion, but obviously it wasn't as a regular format as the briefings are now, which just makes it easier for us to prepare. We know that, you know, we on our team know that, you know, there will be press briefings. These are the issues that we want to ask. Is we kind of can be prepared on a better in a better way than we perhaps were under the Trump administration. Um, and uh, but also kind of related to that, it was just uh, because the briefing room was not used on a regular basis under Trump. It forced us a lot to be much more on our toes and kind of prepare for you know the president to pop his head into the briefing room any moment and just kind of always have questions, always have, always kind of be on your game and be prepared for that. Actually, my second week at the Post, um, which was also just like my first time ever at the White House, I had gone like once maybe under the Obama administration um, just for like a meeting when it, because I was primarily still covering Congress. Um, I happened to be in the briefing room when Trump like popped his head in and said something about like a deal with North Korea. Um, and it was the first time that he had actually, that Trump had actually been in the briefing room. Uh, this was when I think either later that night, a lot of the negotiators from North Korea like spoke on the White House driveway. And obviously that was all kind of unexpected and just kind of really, I'm hopefully I'm, I'm sure taught me and like everyone else, just the value of kind of expecting the unexpected and being prepared at all times. And then obviously at the beginning of the pandemic, uh, President Trump would pop into the briefing room and have these hour long press conferences with um, every day. I happened to be 
the post brief or the duty reporter the week where he started those daily press conferences. So that was just kind of like this rigorous boot camp almost in, um, in drilling uh, questions to the president of the United States day in and day out. Uh, Chris kind of touched on this. So Chris, if you want to take it first, um, but you know, I'll just say my own experience having covered the White House since 2005. I left and came back a couple of times, but that was my first year in there. It, the, the diversity is very apparent when it is a full house in the briefing room of 49 seats or everybody gathered on uh, in the Rose Garden or the South Lawn. It's very different than what it looked like 15, 16 years ago. And Chris, you, you touched on this, but how do you see the diversity now in the White House press corps impacting the types of questions that come up and the story topics? that are raised at the briefing and the things that are that the White House is pushed on right now? Yeah, I think that because there's this greater diversity in the White House press corps, we're seeing a uh, greater diversity of questions from different uh, constituencies um, in the briefing room. Um, those constituencies are both, you know, national, international, some local and on occasion, sometimes local reporters come in to ask questions about the D.C. area. And uh, also there's plane flying above me if you're hearing that, so I will, sorry about that. And uh, the, um, I, I, and I think that there's just also, so, so different communities and more diverse communities are being represented in, in the White House, in the White House press corps. And on top of that, I think with the changing nature of the media, uh, I think that reporters are more willing to ask questions that uh, would be more, suitable for an audience for uh, on the internet for individuals reading a blog, for individuals uh, on Twitter, um, as opposed to more mainstream media outlets that we traditionally see in the White House press corps. Um, so, uh, you know, in those respects, I think that uh, we're seeing a, a, a greater diversity. Janet, do you think um, there still is the potential though because yes, you can have a diverse group of reporters in the room uh, from diverse backgrounds, but at the end of the day, we're all still Washington reporters and we're thinking of things through the lens of Washington, the White House, Capitol Hill, the federal government. Is there, even with this diverse group of people in that briefing room, is there still a risk of a bit of groupthink when it comes to what we think are the biggest stories right now? And maybe there's a disconnect between what your audience, your viewers are most interested in right now? For sure, I, I think so, because like you said, we're such in this bubble, right? We as reporters uh, uh, suffer the same problems as politicians, I would say, in the DC area. We are in the swamp or in the bubble. So I think what, what I must give credit to both uh, the early Trump administration with uh, Sean Spicer, and uh, now they're having it every Friday, bringing in those local reporters, because they do bring in good questions that maybe you and I would have not thought about because we're not in those communities. And uh, what happens in Washington does affect the whole nation. It doesn't just affect us. And while we do work for national publications uh, that are being read and watched by millions of Americans in every corner of the U.S., we're not leaving their reality. So I think that is very important to bring in those voices. And they don't have to be Hispanic, they don't have to be Black, but they have to be representative of their communities. And uh, I do encourage this White House to continue that. And I was saddened when that didn't continue in the Trump administration, because that was a good, uh, out of the many, th many not so good things that they did with the press, I think that was one good thing that happened in that briefing room. So I hope uh, that that does continue because it is important to have those local voices bring those questions in and maybe those that open our eyes for our own reporting and for our own, um, you know, for, for the value of information that that gets uh, spoken of in that briefing room. So it's definitely it definitely needs to happen more. I mean, do you want to jump in on that? <laughs> yeah, so I think it really. Um, the types of questions that get asked are really, I mean, we obviously brainstorm questions, brainstorm story ideas, um, just by talking to sources, you know, talking to the newsroom, talking to our editors, seeing what needs to be reported. But so many of, you know, you know, story ideas writ large and the questions that, you know, and by extension, the questions that we ask um, in the briefing room when we do get our chances to do that are things that are interesting to us because perhaps we have a different perspective and a different way of looking at life. And I think that was really evident for me personally, um, just with the 
the spikes over the last year of hate crimes against Asian Americans. I mean, that is something obviously it's in the news. You guys are all aware of it, but it is much more personal to perhaps someone like me when, you know, my mother is telling me not to go, you know, walk out at night. We see videos and images of people being assaulted who look like our grandmothers and grandfathers. And that prompts us because it's important to us. We know a broader community of people that it's important to, then that prompts us to, you know, like we just did, we just again from CBS did several times to press uh, President Trump on his, re- on his rhetoric during the pandemic. Or, you know, I, I happened to be in the briefing room um, shortly after the, um, the Atlanta spa shootings where a lot of these issues were coming up. Um, and it was also at the time where there was uh, the issues of diversity in the administration, the lack of diversity among of Asian Americans in the, aversion, in the administration came up. I mean, we can, you know, when we have a seat in the briefing room, we can ask questions on any number of topics in a day, but, for us, we know that we know much more acutely how important this is to us. And that helps kind of elevate those types of questions to the briefing room level that perhaps may not have happened before. Mm-hmm. If I may, if I may jump in something that came to my mind as you were talking about the Asian American and those questions being asked from a personal level, I remember when the pandemic first started, I um, there was a press conference uh, with President Trump. He came to the briefing room and I asked, how do you plan to solve or to to um, what was it? I don't remember the question exactly, but basically along the lines, how do we deal with this pandemic when you're ignoring 11 million undocumented immigrants? And I don't think that is a question that might have been asked because if you don't live in that reality and you don't think of that population necessarily, mm-hmm. you know, you're thinking of the broader, of the broader subject. But, you know, if you have 11 million people that are not being or are being disengaged from a pandemic, then, then you don't go anywhere. Um, you, you don't solve the problem. So, but in other people's mind, that might have not come up um, as a priority to ask of the president. I also like to jump in on this too, as a reporter for an LGBTQ news outlet, because I think that because of my uh, personal identity and because um, you know so much of my audience and so much of my, so many of my sources are members of the LGBT community, I think that I'm a little more closely in tune to uh, issues that are uh, you know, affecting uh, the, the LGBT community. Um, you know, now so much with the, uh, the transgender issue as uh, so many states are enacting these uh, laws against transgender youth. So I, I do think that more than any other report in the, in the briefing room, I, I have this uh, unique perspective that, uh, you know, keeps me, in, uh, that makes, makes them, I'm asking unusual questions, original questions, uh, approaching uh, me, uh, uh, issues in the media and the news that are uh, from a different way than other reporters would. I think that uh, enables me to uh, you know, make it more of a unique contribution in addition to serving uh, the LGBT uh, community. Well, and Chris, I was going to go to you next, and that kind of perfectly pivots to what I was going to ask you. You know, you asked a lot of tough, really good questions during the Trump administration on uh, LGBTQ issues, and obviously this is, you're serving your audience. And now, what is it like to cover the Biden administration, which has taken different positions, pursuing different policies on those same issues, the priorities that he outlined as a candidate and now as president? I think there'd be a sense of, well, is it a little easier to cover this type of administration? What's that like? And how does that help you or how does that push you to frame your questions and stories uh, now covering this administration? Counterintuitively, I don't think it is necessarily easier to cover uh, Biden uh, than it is with Trump, because even though the policy approaches between the two presidents are very, very different, uh, you know, we uh, the transgender military ban was put in place under Trump. And reversed early on during the Biden administration. Um, the it's a lot more difficult to it, it's it's very different because in the Trump administration the expectation was uh, that uh, he'd be taking actions against the LGBT community and my questions are more geared towards uh, what was happening with those actions. Now with the Biden administration the expectation is that he will do things that are positive for the LGBT community. So a lot of my questions are more towards why aren't you fulfilling these promises? Why aren't you doing? Why aren't you uh, making good on that? Uh, when, when are we going to get to these promises that, that uh, you have uh, ma- made for the community? So like the basic groundwork for my, my questions have changed given the, uh, the administration. And I also think that uh, it's a little bit when you have a, uh, a, 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 a presidency where the policy is 
uh, the policy changes are more welcome for your audience. It's more difficult for me to uh, find areas of tension, which is usually the source of a, a of a, a question to uh, present to the uh, to, to the uh, uh, my questionings uh, for the White House press secretary. Oftentimes, I'm gathering information from other uh, institutions that are acting on these issues, much like the state legislatures are acting on these uh, uh, measures with uh, for uh, against transgender youth. So. There was definitely a really fundamental change from where my course stemmed from going from a place where people, the expectation was there was going to be a policy against my readership to an administration where people, uh, the expectation is that uh, there'd be supportive actions from the presidency. Uh, and Janet, do you feel a pressure uh, to ask certain questions in the briefing room, depending on what you think your viewers are interested in? I mean, how, what is that, you know? working for such a prominent Latino news organization, what does that mean then when it's your chance to ask the president or the press secretary or any senior official a question and how that helps you formulate your line of questions for them? Sure, I think it's interesting because maybe we are or I am seen at the White House as the immigration reporter or the immigration only reporter who only asks questions about immigration. And that doesn't mean that I only cover immigration, but when you're in a position where you are the only Hispanic language television or print um, who is represented in that small group. Now there's only 14 of us rotating at any given time. And uh, it is my responsibility to ask those questions that I may not be covering that story today, but I'm not one of my colleagues in the country is covering an immigration story that will benefit from a White House administration or a government official uh, response. And uh, so it falls on me to go to that White House and ask those specific questions when I know that the press corps will be asking other questions that I may be working on. Yesterday, I, I covered um, the, um, the vaccine, uh, the new vaccine goal, for example, but we also had the family separation, the reunifications happening in another part of the country. So it would have been a day that if I was in the White House briefing room, even though I'm covering vaccines and COVID and whatnot, let my colleagues ask those questions and I will go ahead and ask the question that may have not been asked by anyone else about the family reunification. How fast will it happen? There were only four families this week. What can we expect in the following weeks? Because I know those questions will go unanswered otherwise. I think there was, um, I heard this, I'm not going to source any or name any sources, but at the press conference, uh, the only press conference we've had with, uh, with President Biden other than the bilat, um, I was the last reporter. And there were many questions that people wanted answered, but unfortunately, my beat, or fortunately for me, my mm -hmm. beat is immigration. And those are the questions that I needed to ask at that point. And I heard a little criticism that, oh, this is the last question and it's going to be on immigration again, after so many other reporters had already asked on the subject. But it was my responsibility to get those answers from my community from our perspective, which is also very different that ABC, CBS, the CNN's perspective, we're leaving the story on the ground uh, from coast to coast with all of our correspondents covering many of the daily, daily happenings of immigration. So we, we do ask, I do believe that we ask the questions differently because we're talking to the people affected every day. So yes, I will continue asking those immigration stories because they're important for us and because I know you guys are doing such a great job asking all the other questions that are also being reported on our network. And, um, and we also cover day in and day out. I think it's a good just to point out for people who are watching that don't know how the process works at the White House. You know, right now there are only 14 seats in the briefing room because of COVID restrictions. And at the president's press conference, there were about 40 some, I think total, 50-ish total. So it's not everybody is there. And the president called on 10 people. And I think because of the kind of the Twitter chatter after that, there isn't a coordination among all of us about, you know, and you're going to ask the economic question and you're going to ask the immigration question. So sometimes that means some topics don't come up because it might have been different if 10 other reporters have been called on and every single question was about Russia or education, something else. Uh, so I, I think it's always I get this question a lot from people outside of our industry of like, how do you all work together to decide? I'm like, there really isn't a work together to decide. And you do have to serve your particular audience. And sometimes that means it's it's a follow up on something else that was already asked. But, you know, 
when you start looking at a lot of niche media, especially now, you've got to ask the questions that your uh, subscribers are most interested in. Um, I also should note too, if you are listening, watching, and want to submit a question, please do so in the chat function at the bottom of the screen there. Um, you know, we we kind of talked a little bit about this, but there was a really interesting interview I read the other day that Audie Cornish of NPR did with uh, Elle magazine. And she was talking about feeling pressure to be like an influencer, that journalists now have to do so much personal branding. And she just was like, does not want to do that. And I think that's been a very big thing over the past four years during the Trump administration, the people in that briefing room becoming stars, you know, people who were not household names in 2015 suddenly were because of their interactions with White House officials or the president themselves. Whoever wants to jump in on this too, of like what that feeling was like covering the Trump administration. And at times, and I say this as it happened to me too, like becoming a bit of the story when the president made you part of that story. Uh, so one, that's one part, but then also how much of the pressure you feel to, you know, really get yourself out there and do all of the social media platforms and everything else that comes with it in addition to your job, just because that's the, the nature of the industry right now. If I may just a little anecdote on that, the first press briefing that Sean Spicer held, he called on me third. And within half an hour, Fox News had put up an article how dare Sean Spicer call Univision with my name on it before Fox News? I'm like, how is this news? And how am I the story now? How, how is this happening? It was unbelievable to this day. I cannot believe that was an issue for Fox News that Univision would be called before them. And, um, and I don't like to be the news. I, and, and I'll leave it at that because I, I do not do social media as well as I should have. And, uh, and I have a two-year-old. So there's no time for that. <laughs> yeah, I think what we all kind of experienced under the Trump administration that was that President Trump and his aides and his supporters just had this concerted strategy of making us the opposition, which I think any journalist would be really uncomfortable put in that position. Um, because like Janet said, we don't want to be the story. I mean, I've had we don't have to talk about it, but I've been like the story recently and it makes me really uncomfortable because we report the story. We're supposed to be in the backdrop telling, you know, talking to our sources and telling, talking to readers and telling people what's really going on. And that was a, that was a particular strategy that the former president took on. And I think that, I think most of us tried to do our best to kind of make it clear that our work needs to speak for ourselves, ourselves that we're not going to kind of try to engage in this mudsling back and forth. Um, I did find the Audi Cornish interview interesting because it, it we it, so a lot of the shift that we've seen recently too in political journalism, and I'm sure the, the that heightened public focus on the Trump administration kind of sped up the shift is that. So many high profile reporters are becoming kind of brands and entities in their own right. You know, back in the day, we were always kind of attached to our news organizations. And, and that was like the brand that was put forward. But, you know, now, especially as reporters shift back and forth between various news outlets, like a lot of readers follow the reporter because that reporter has like an established brand and established following and established track record of good reporting. Um so I understand the pressure to kind of cultivate that. But at the end of the day, um, I, I do think like I use Twitter for work, obviously my Facebook and Instagram are totally personal. Like I won't let people follow me on Instagram if I don't know you in person or know you in real life. I do think that it still is true that your a journalistic brand is still cultivated by good reporting, you know, breaking news, you know, asking good questions, writing stories that are uh, that are new and interesting and have a different spin on it. And I do believe that that ultimately breaks through at the end of the day. Um, so, you, so hopefully you don't have to, people don't have to freak out and worry about having to be on all these different platforms to promote yourselves. I, I hope that. Um, at the end of the day, I, I think it's still true that good reporting is going to be what establishes your brand and that again can allow you to speak for yourself 
and not let you become the story, but your your work, your own, be the be what is highlighted. I would just like to build on that. That's a very fantastic response. But a couple of things that I would just contribute to that is that I've noticed that myself too, as I feel like I have been getting a little bit more attention personally uh, as being a White House reporter than I have um, in years past. And I do think as opposed to, I, I'm just used to myself as being someone who is trying to go to the White House to get questions answered for the issues that I think are important for the community that I think is, is important for our readership. And now that also I'm, I'm being more inserted into it, like my, whatever is happening with my process. And it's, it's um, not common, but I see this uh, emerging in some other like, stories on the White House press corps, uh, for example. So, uh, but I, I think it is true that uh, tr- that as a result of, in some respect, Trump making the media the opposition. But I also think that it is the result of uh, the uh, the expectation that the media was supposed to hold, hold uh, Trump, uh, uh, Trump Trump accountable. I think that was a little bit higher more than uh, than other presidencies, and so that there was a little more of a uh, more of a closer scrutiny as to what these uh, what these journalists were doing, and and, um, and that greater visibility. It does make me uncomfortable as a journalist because I shouldn't be the story. And um, at the same time too, I am, I, I am not aligned politically. I take that very seriously in my approach to my questions. I try to be fair regardless of uh, whichever uh, administration is in power. And so, so I, I do get uncomfortable about that. At the same time, I do see value in this greater visibility because if you have a greater profile, then you have uh, people are more willing to come to you for, as information. They see you as somebody who is do, who's out there and that some of this more greater visibility can serve as a bridge to your reporting uh, for what, what, you, what you're writing on for, and, and, and it can serve as kind of a way for a gateway for sources to bring information as to what they know, what their concerns are, uh, there's any questions they want to have asked in the briefing room. So there is a benefit to that at the same time that I definitely prefer to have the, word, the topic that I'm writing about be the story as opposed to myself. Uh, and just to kind of keep going on a little bit of a social media theme, you know, I, you are all very active on social media, as you say, like through Twitter for work purposes. And I am too. And, you know, one thing that's so different from when I first started covering the White House is just that there is Twitter because there wasn't then. Uh, and even in the beginning of the Obama administration, it wasn't like the thing that everybody was having this dialogue on all day. You know, if I'm in the briefing room and I ask a question and and within 30 seconds, like I'm getting responses to what I just asked or follow-ups or you should have done it this way or good job doing it that way. I mean, there's it's, it's instant feedback, which is nice. You know, how much of that do you guys get and how do you think that that actually helps? Because, you know, it is, it, Twitter is everybody out there. Um, and have you found that there's a diversity of your followers that has sparked something in you and thought, oh, I should think about that differently. Or I could ask that question the next time in a briefing uh, because that's something that somebody posed to me. I mean, how useful can it be, too, for b- bringing a different perspective to your questions and a different perspective to the narrative at the White House briefing? Sadly, in terms of social media contributing to my reporting or my questions, I, I can't say, I just, in that aspect, I can't say uh, very nice things about Twitter. I, I kind of consider just basically a giant cesspool. Except, yeah. I'm this reporter, and except for, there's all these like stepping stones of valuable points. I'm, like other, other uh, thought leaders might want to outre- do out- outreach to and uh, giving greater visibility to what I'm doing in my reporting. So in terms of like contributions, I think they're they're minimal at best. I think they're mostly just uh, viscerally uh, a lot of visceral text, no matter what you do. And and generally speaking, I just kind of tune them out. There are other ways to get a hold of me if you really want to get a hold of me. Uh, there are other ways to do that other than by uh, you know uh, trying to uh, tweet at me because I probably will not see that, just given the fact that just so much animosity on 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 social media. So uh, in that respect, I mean. Social media is also probably the, one of the most stronger points where you can articulate your ideas now because uh, things are shared so quickly. Things are, things are people are, are, I think, probably more uh, inclined to see a tweet as news than they were uh, uh, many years ago. I think that's the biggest change that I've seen in media so far. It's just kind of the a tweet itself being a news event, which is something that, I, like, when I was like, uh, I, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm getting a little bit older now. When I was a prison journalist, that'd be something that would just be something that would would be unheard of. Um, the tweet itself being news. Uh, so uh, it has, so social media has its, uh, its, uh, its uses, but um, 
in terms of having like the general audiences, general, the general public being able to connect with you, I don't think it's terribly helpful. And I think we grappled with it so much during the Trump administration and how much do we report on the tweets? How much do we retweet the tweets? How much do we give his tweets um, the place? Uh, how much does it deserve to be um, looked at? So for me, I, I second Chris, I'm not a person that does Twitter very well. Um, I am a TV person, so I should be doing a lot more. I do see when I um, when I tweet something that people start fighting each other, that they start, um, you know, sometimes like, this was not what I meant to provoke. And, uh, and I, I have yet to really understand how to use it to my advantage. Let's just say it that way. I, I sure a question here and there pops up every once in a while that I'm like, yeah, that's a good question. Or people reach out to me asking that I ask the White House about their own personal cases or their circumstances, especially a lot on immigration uh, because of what happened with uh, President Trump and so many things being reversed now, whether they have a chance to come to this country. So little things like that, personal cases, but in a broader sense, um, yeah, it's not something that I <laughs> that I go to to if I want to be enlightened in any way. It's not a good promo for <laughs> Twitter or social media. So, men, a little better experience, or also a. I was about to say, I like when you first asked your question. I was gonna have, I was gonna say, I had a little bit of, of perhaps a contrarian view, but I guess I have the same view as Chris <laughs> and Janet. I just, in terms of actual feedback, at, especially over the last few months. For me personally, Twitter has become so toxic that, and also my email and my contact is about, not my cell phone, but my email is on my Twitter profile. If you really have feedback that you want me to see, whether it's constructive or even really critical or useless, like readers do email me and I actually do read those, do respond to those especially the constructive criticism. Um, so I just, I think for my own mental health, I try not to look at the mentions anymore. Well, but we have to also note that wonderful trip that you and I were on together in 2019, I think. Well, yeah, or, that's right. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I'm still getting tweets about this. Sungman and I were pool on uh, a Trump <laughs> visit to South Korea, and there was a, a K pop boy band that greeted the Trumps at this cocktail hour reception. And we had no idea who they were, but we looked them up and we both tweeted that they were at this event. And I probably would bet that that was my most viral tweet ever because <laughs> there's a massive K-pop Twitter world. <laughs> yeah, K-pop Twitter is a thing. It was, <laughs> and actually, I was going to bring up our trip uh, just in the context of what we're talking about in terms of diversity and how important it is, uh, especially diversity in the language skills that you have in your newsrooms and how important that is. And I and for all the obvious reasons, but the one example I will bring up with Karen and I was that um, Karen had to do her like radio hit and our, our bus driver still had his engine going and it was like super loud and he didn't speak English, but obviously he was Korean. I spoke Korean and I was able to tell him to, can you just please turn it off for like 10 minutes so my friend over here can do her radio hit. So that's why you have different language skills in your newsroom. So you can tell the Korean bus driver to <laughs> when you're at the blue house in Seoul. But you did not come in handy on the K-pop references. And I did not. And my Korean friends were quite ashamed of me. <laughs> so. Um, you know, I'm wondering if there's an example, and anybody can jump in on this, of an example of a story that you have personally covered as a White House reporter over the last handful of years where you were covering it one way and you thought that the broader narrative of how the press corps or Washington was covering it was not the right tone or not the right angle, just not hitting the right notes, uh, and that you were doing it a different way. I think I was the first one in the briefing room to call the immigration crisis a crisis. I was the first one to ask that question of Jen Psaki. Why, if everyone else at the border is calling the, calling this a crisis, why are you not? And I did not see a mainstream reporter ask that question for about another week after I had first asked that question of Jen Psaki. So, uh, my, you know, to our defense, I think when we cover immigration, because it is our bread and butter here at Univision, um, a lot of the stories reflected on mainstream media does not, 
they don't necessarily reflect the reality on the ground. Um, so we do tell those stories a little differently. We have the language advantage and whatnot. And, and, and kudos to mainstream media for having so many Latino reporters today that can go to the border and that can speak the language and that can communicate with, um, with the migrants and whatnot. But I think we'll always be just a little step ahead of the game there. So, so yeah, that was something that just happened recently. I think it was at least a week difference uh, between the time I asked that question first and then everyone else started pressing on the crisis. Um, crisis. Mm. Yeah. I would like echo that. I think as in working for an LGBT newspaper, I feel that this is a situation that I encounter quite frequently, actually. I, when mainstream media outlets cover LGBT news issues, I think they will very often go to these LGBT groups for perspective for some quotes on what they're saying. And um, a lot of these groups have uh, certain narratives that they want to have uh, uh, um, in, in, in the media. And as someone who just constantly covers these LGBT issues and like been very like for the past decade being a very um, attuned to a lot of uh, trends and details, a lot of times my perspective is, especially being as someone who is non-aligned in my reporting, is a lot different uh, than what uh, these LGBT groups would say, for example, like uh, there a lot, I was just noticing there's a lot of in the mainstream media, these stories on 100 days uh, of Biden, what that means for LGBT issues. And I think predominantly it was covered in the media as Biden is taking all these executive actions uh, for you know LGBT people uh, that, uh, you know, he's reversed the transgender military ban. He signed the executive order on on day one. Uh, there's the memorandum prioritizing LGBTQ human rights at the State Department. Um, these are all things that groups want to present. However, I think I'm a little more sensitive to promises that Biden made over the campaign. He said he was going to sign the Equality Act legislation uh, that was going to update the civil rights law to protect LGBTQ people within 100 days of his presidency. And that would be his number one legislative priority. And I think a lot of these groups seem to have forgotten that over uh, uh, since uh, Biden has, has taken office. And so my story on Biden's 100 days was focusing on this legislative promise that he made, which is a, a kind of a cornerstone achievement. And, um, and, I, and I felt a little, having a little more latitude to do that as opposed to more mainstream media outlets, because I, I'm familiar with, I feel very solid in my understanding of what's going on and being able to say, uh, this is what happened. This is what's really happening despite what other outlets are, are, are telling you. And a quick example to add to that, I think, um, and I'll go back to um, the diversity point that we discussed earlier within the administration. So the way that I saw the story when during the transition and obviously now um, at the White House, when Biden's team would tout that they have the most diverse uh, administration in history, which is true by many metrics, it is not true by one major metric. The fact that it is the first time in 20 years that there is no cabinet level secretary who is um, Asian American or Pacific Islander. And that what, and so that's kind of the prism that I always, I always kind of look at when the diversity metric comes up. Um, I, and this was something that we had, and obviously once the cabinet is filled, the focus can turn to that and that kind of, uh, and, and that kind of the, the, the lacking of the Asian American have an official who's there, but this is something that people have been talking to me, people who are, who have been closely tracking the transition or in potential Asian American advocacy groups, people who are in potential, uh, who in line for potential positions. I mean, this is a problem that they had started to point out back in, I, I wanna say December, that they were worried that Asian Americans would be left out of these cabinet level secretary posts. So that's kind of the perspective that I brought just by virtue of talking with these people on a regular basis that uh, when the Biden administration counts the most first cabinet in history, you, I always kind of looked at it with, except for this one kind of big asterisk. Uh, we've got our first student question. Candice, you are up. Thank you. Hi. Um, thank you so much, everyone, for your thoughts and your perspectives. Um, as we think about new faces in the briefing room, I would love to hear your thoughts on what voices do you think are still missing in the White House press corps? Um, what perspectives still need to, brought, need to be brought into the conversation in this space? I will take that because one thing that I definitely have noticed and I feel badly about is that as uh, I, I feel like I represent the LGBT community in the White House press score, but as the acronym itself shows, there are a lot of letters in that community. And, uh, and I do my best to represent you know, the, the community uh, 
all aspects of it. But let's face it, it's the transgender community that is facing the, that's the focus of the, of uh, what, we're, what we're talking about right now. And there is no transgender person in the White House press corps. And I find that to be, uh, if, I, if I step back and think about that, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's disappointing. I do my best as a, I feel like I have a way to, uh, a, as a sexual minority, I have a way to connect with, uh, with the understanding of the transgender community, but I am not transgender. And I'm just, I'm there just as a, as a supporter. So um, the fact that we don't have a transgender reporter in the briefing room is something that I think is, is, is disappointing. And we're going to go to another student question, Darcy, in one second, but I also just want to do a quick follow up on that, because what does that signal then to you guys of obviously we've all had mentors in our career and, you know, people that we've looked up to uh, either directly that we work with or in the White House press corps, you know, what type of responsibility then do you have and how much do you guys do to start pulling other people up to keep increasing that diversity uh, and, and get those voices there that aren't there right now? From our perspective, so I am, like I said before, the only Hispanic media outlet that has a seat in the briefing room, but I'm only there every other week. And sometimes because the president has been traveling, I won't be there for three weeks at a time. And for those three weeks, while yes, so some of the questions are being asked, there's a lot of questions that go unasked because I don't I am not there. And a lot of our outlets, because Univision is not alone. I mean, you have Telemundo, you have print media, you have a lot of Hispanic media outlets that do serve the Hispanic community that are not getting their questions answered necessarily because I'm only there um, so little. So if we had more of us, that would be great. I understand the pandemic has also put a lot of restrictions as to how much and how many of us can be there. But um, but we're we are pushing so hard the association and the White House to have more Hispanic media represented at the briefing room um, and more often. Right. And I will also and I will just kind of note to um, in terms of needing more of the representation in the briefing room, what. I think I think the one thing that we're seeing right now, we've also referenced this earlier, is the lack of geographic diversity. Because when you have reporters from who who report for papers in Texas or Nevada, they can get Texas and Nevada specific questions to Jen Psaki or to other White House officials that we are not going to think of with, uh, you know, for me at the post with kind of a national general audience or with our respective audiences. And again like Spicer did uh, for a little bit, um, and also what the White House is doing now in terms of bringing local reporters virtually in the briefing room is great. But um, I just always wish, I like, I look at the, um, I look at, for example, the growing numbers of reporters in the hills of the cap or in the, in the halls of the Capitol, but what's diminishing from those numbers are reporters who work for specific um, regional news outlets, um, you know, all over the country who can specifically ask questions on to in Washington of issues that affect readers back at home. Um, you see that in Congress, you see that in the White House. Um, and so I think, and I think that really hurts our readers as well. Um, and hopefully that can change in different ways. Yeah, and that local angle is so important right now because there is $1.9 trillion that went out with the first COVID relief bill and the president's pushing $2.3 trillion more dollars for infrastructure. And that's such a local thing. I mean, we cover it from Washington, but that is money that is going out there that will impact local communities. And, you know, I have the benefit, I get to talk to ABC radio stations every morning across the country. And it's striking to hear sometimes what the big buzzy things are in Kansas City or Cincinnati that aren't the big buzzy thing in the White House briefing, but that hopefully helps inform my thinking of let's make sure we're remembering what everybody out there cares about too, right. just not inside the beltway. Um, and now we'll go to another student question, Darcy our familiar introducer. <laughs> Hi, I'm go. back. Um, uh, so I had a more broad question, but as a senior and as someone who's starting her career and everything like that, I've gotten a lot of different opinions and a lot of different pieces of advice about what you should do and what I should be doing with my career, what's the right decision, what's not the right decision. And I was wondering as people who are have access to probably the smartest people in the world and who are working with some of the most successful people. I was wondering how you all sort through like which opinions to listen to, which advice to take. Um, and I think you could go in that any different direction with that question, so. <laughs> who wants to go? 
Uh, One thing that I can, I, I, I weigh in uh, some, with, with some initial thoughts on that, because I, I actually get asked that question or like a variation on that quite a bit from college students. Like, what do I do? How do I get my get going? College is behind me. My education is behind me. Now I got to go up and start my career and start making some money. And I think that reason why I get that is that there's really no right answer for that question anymore. I mean, before when you were in school, you had very you know specific goals that were just had to be met. I mean, you had to graduate from this program. You had to get good grades. You had to make certain metrics because that is going to uh, be able to show off for whatever you want to do uh, once that has concluded. So, um, like there, there really is no right answer to that question, and it's just and it's probably it must sound a little trite, but it's it's about the you know pursuit of happiness. So you just got to think about what it's going to do to make you happy, what's going to make you fulfilled. Uh, and, uh, and, and try your best to set up a plan to do that. I would also add that as you are, one thing also a big thing that happened from college to professional life that really I think is important is that optics are really important. When you're in school, uh, you have all these teachers who are there who are paid to help you to educate you. Now all of a sudden you're in a new world where you are a person who is getting a paycheck and you're expected to produce. And you might think that you can get all your work done and then uh, you know, play on your phone for like an hour and that's okay. No, that's not okay. I mean, when you're in front of your employer, you have to like make it look like you are doing something that's a, that's a value to the, uh, uh, to the uh, person who is employing you. So that's a, a big thing that I would do. And, and I really can't tell you like what is going to be the right course of action for what you what we want to do. I would just try to find something that you can do that will keep you, uh, you know, uh, you got to have good finances and also it's going to make you something that you'd be able to do every morning and uh, for a long time and not get tired of it. Yeah, I think what I would say to that question is that could hopefully apply for a broad swath of people, because like Chris said, it is kind of tough advice to give um, for for people who are graduating. Uh, just be open to any sort of possibility, whether it's a location or a type of job or kind of anything in your career, even if it's not something that you may not have envision for yourself or the type of news organization or a location um, and just be really flexible to different opportunities. I think my my first job out of college um, after I graduated from Iowa I actually ended up being at the Star Ledger in Newark, New Jersey, but the job that I was going to take was actually in San Antonio, Texas. Um, I did not, I do not know a soul in Texas. I don't even, I don't know if I know anyone now, but I certainly didn't back then as an Iowa girl. Um, but I just wanted to say yes to different opportunities. Um, and it also just because um, you are not going to have that flexibility when you're our age, you know, with families and mortgages and other responsibilities. Like if I wanted to just kind of sit up today and say, like, I want to go to Europe to like go cover the EU, like I got to plan a little bit more to do that. So just to really take advantage of the flexibility and the freedom that you have when you are at 22, 23 years old to pursue um, all sorts of different opportunities that may come up, even if it's not what kind of how you mapped out your kind of career path to be. And there's so there's much, so, much so many more avenues today than there were when we when I certainly graduated college, it was so structured. You sent your tape to a TV station and this is how it went. And, you know, the, the opportunities were so much more limited. Now I feel like the world, you, you can conquer the world. You can go to a niche uh, organization. You can go to a podcast. You can do anything and everything you want to do, uh, depending on what your interests are. So um, the, there's so many opportunities available to new graduates that I would just not think broadly what you want to do, but not so much as to I must do A, B, and C in order to achieve, I don't know, my goals. Just be open-minded about the opportunities that are out there. And even though they may not be mainstream, some um, some other things that, that are on the market right now that sound extremely interesting to me anyway, so would be, would be pursuable. I'll just do a quick answer before we go to our last student question, Michael. <laughs> um, but I would also say uh, connecting with a mentor at an early stage in your career, maybe another mentor at a mid-career uh, stage, you know, that's so important, especially in a town like Washington, which is 
you know, yes, the most powerful city in the world for some people, but it's a small little village in so many aspects. And you encounter so many of the same people through many levels of your career and getting to know somebody that can help you navigate that and introduce you to the right people is very important. And my plug for Georgetown, all the Hoyas that are listening to is, you know, tap into the alumni network of GU politics and the broader Georgetown alumni network. The school is in Washington. A lot of people come to the school and then stay in Washington like myself. So find somebody out there that is doing something that you would like to do, talk to them about it, and then see what you can do with that person too. We all like to talk about ourselves and our careers. So <laughs> reach out to journalists. We're not shy about that. <laughs> um, and I think we do have a couple of quick seconds left. Michael, if you want to go, sorry to butt in there for a second. <laughs> Problem. thank you so much. And thank you for such a fascinating discussion from our panelists. I'm studying a master's in democracy and governance, and I'm actually an institu international student from South Africa. So my question is, as an international student from Africa, I'd like to know from the panelists how they have been able to work themselves or with their colleagues to approach catering to the interests of the international community, particularly in the global south. Thank you. Janet, I saw you nodding your head. Do you want to jump in? Yeah, on? sure. We only yes, have a couple we seconds. Sorry. Yeah, we, we do this day in and day out as, as we do broadcast in the U.S., but we have a huge broadcast in Mexico and in Central America. So we find the characters that would be relatable to, to those uh, people in our outside of the U.S. communities. Um, you really got to figure out who will be the most representative uh, to um, to the, the stories of where your readers or your viewers will be and, and let them tell the story so that those people that will be watching in, in our case will feel related, related to, to what you're telling them. It's not foreign to them. We'll do a little kind of quick lightning round for the last question, um, which I don't know if I told you guys this one beforehand, but I, just <laughs> last one quickly. Um, what, here we are, it's May 5th, 2021, first year of the Biden administration. From, from the perspective of the White House press corps, what is the one thing you'd like to see change by the last year of the Biden administration, of, of the White House press corps and what it looks like? More press conferences by President <laughs> Biden. <laughs> That's what I was going to say, too. I mean, Biden said one, I think, and we, we need to have, we need to see our president more to help, hold them accountable for transparency. That's like the major thing I can think of. Mm -hmm. Um, and hopefully, I mean, hopefully this is by this year and not necessarily the last year of the Biden administration, but make sure we get the access back that had been curved by the pandemic restrictions. But also, I mean, and again, like going back to an earlier point, this is a long term project, but just having more outlets in the briefing room that are represented, hopefully from across the country and or finding unique ways of making sure questions from all over the country are asked. So I really hope that they, you know, the White House would keep up with these virtual Skype questions. I mean, I think the first question that was asked was someone in Alaska to, about this issue that I'd like literally never heard of before. And I found it so fascinating. And just the more of that, the better. Yeah. And I think when, when the COVID restrictions start to become uh, more eased, then we, there will be more people back in there. And hopefully that increases the diversity of questions and backgrounds and storylines that we're all covering. So Janet, Chris, Youngman, thank you so much, guys, for doing this. This was fantastic. And thank you, everybody who tuned into it. Uh, the next panel up is at four o'clock with Zeke Miller of the Associated Press, the president of the White House Correspondents Association. And he will be talking to Press Secretary Jen Psaki, who was doing a briefing while we were doing this. So we'll go <laughs> now all look at our phones and see what we missed and then she'll get a grilling from Zeke at four o'clock so thank you all for joining us